We're out in the parking garage here at WDIV in Detroit, and for this final episode, we thought we'd do something a little different. So uh, come on, get in the car. We're gonna take a little ride. All righty. The first question is, is where do we want to start? Well, I don't guess it matters. Well, do you want to start to the farthest north away? And then, is that the, the, and then, well, uh, why don't we, for the sake of what do you the want story, to do let's, go, let's start at the Red Fox and then go to the Lakata House. Okay. Yeah, so we can kind of get a sense of how, how close they are to each other. Head southwest on West Lafayette Boulevard toward 3rd Avenue. In today's episode, we're going to visit some of the locations that are key to the Hoffa story. Our first stop is about 20 miles north of Detroit. So while we're riding, let's get caught up on the events that led to Hoffa's final meeting. In the summer of 1975, Hoffa was running out of options. He wanted the power back in his hands, presidency of the Teamsters Union, and he believed he could get it. But the union offered no support. His longtime organized crime associates told him he should take his pension and retire, but he had no interest in that. Hoffa knew that the only way back to power was if he could convince East Coast crime and labor boss Tony Provenzano to back him. What Hoffa didn't know was that a decision had already been made. Mob bosses believed Hoffa was going to share their secrets with the FBI, so Jimmy Hoffa had to go. Journalist Dan Moldea says he spoke to an informant who claimed it was Tony Provenzano who put a contract out on Hoffa's life. In late 1973, early 1974. So who do you think was, was involved in well, your, in your well, estimation? Here's the first thing you have to understand. Former assistant U.S. attorney was, uh, Keith Corbett. Every city was controlled by the boss of that city. New York City being somewhat exceptional in that they had five families. But basically what happens is if you were the Provenzano, say, coming in from New Jersey and your intention was to do something to Jimmy Hoffa, uh, mob etiquette, for want of a better word, would have required that you seek the permission and authorization of the, the family here in Detroit. So if people from outside Detroit came to Detroit for the purpose of, uh, say, kidnapping or killing Jimmy Hoffa. It would have been necessary to meet with the boss of the Detroit family and indicate what you were going to do. Scott Bernstein thinks it was Detroit's crime boss, Joe Zarelli, who ordered the hit, not Provenzano. He says Tony Pro wasn't a powerful enough figure to have made that call. Whether it originated with Zarelli or Tony Provenzano, or another powerful member of the Mafia, we don't know. But most experts agree the Detroit Mafia was heavily involved in making it happen, two brothers in particular. The Giacalones, both Tony Giacalone and uh, his brother Billy, liked uh, sort of the Gang John Gotti approach. They liked to be known as uh, organized crime figures, and they were the public face of Detroit organized crime in the 70s, 80s, 90s, because they liked to, the spotlight. The Giacalones had known Hoffa since the 1940s. Hoffa trusted them. So when they told him they could help him make peace with Tony Provenzano, he likely believed them. You know, they don't come at you guns blazing. They, they come at you like they're your best friend and they want to help you out and, and they, they rock you to sleep. They, they, they sing you a lullaby. And then right when you're about to close your eyes and you know, go off to dreamland, they stick a shiv in your back or, or put two in the back of your head with a, with a five millimeter or a nine millimeter. From WDIV and Graham Media, my name is Steve Garagiola. You're listening to Shattered Season 4, Hoffa, Episode 5, The Finale. They knew that the... The best way to get Hoffa out into the open was to tell him that Tony Provenzano was open to making a peace agreement and that they would let bygones be bygones and they would meet and they'd put everything aside and that they could, Provenzano was agreeable to giving him the support that Hoffa needed for the 76 election. They just had to come together in a sit down. That meeting was set for the afternoon of July 30th. Hoffa's former driver, Marvin Elkind, says he had a bad feeling. The day before, I told Mr. Hoffa 
there are people that are upset with you. His words to me were, Marvin, my people will never harm me. Bill Buffalino, the longtime in-house counsel uh, attorney for both the Teamsters and the Detroit mob, someone that uh, was believed by m a number of members of law enforcement to be both a made member of the mafia as well as a attorney. His daughter was being married on the first weekend of August. Hoffa disappeared on Wednesday, July 30th, 1975. And it was that following Friday and Saturday that this wedding was gonna take place. So when the Jackalonis came and told Jimmy Hoffa, hey, Tony Provenzano is willing to sit down with you and, and put your differences aside and give you his support. And oh, by the way, he's actually coming in for the Buffalino wedding this week. So this will be a perfect time for us to all meet. It was very believable to Jimmy Hoffa because he knew that Tony Provenzano would be coming in for the Buffalino wedding. And Hoffa wanted to believe it. He shouldn't have believed it because it's crazy to think that after all these years and all these threats and all, of, uh, all this acrimony that all of a sudden Tony Provenzano is going to be open to giving him wh what he's been looking for this whole time and, 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 and provide him the voting delegation to get reelected. But Hoffa was so desperate to take back the Teamsters, he started to convince himself of stuff that wasn't true. And the Jackalonis convinced him that uh, they could arrange the sit-down for July 30th at the Red Fox on uh, Telegraph and Maple for a lunch. All right, we are in Bloomfield Township, Telegraph Road, and Maple, which is 15 mile. That's the way we do our roads in Detroit, by miles. We're at the Andiamo restaurant, which is now an upscale Italian restaurant that uh, in 1975 was the Marcus Red Fox. We're standing in the parking lot. The restaurant has changed a lot. It's been remodeled and, and refurbished in the course of 45 years, new ownership, new, uh, new name. But this was the place. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa spent his last afternoon. And it's a little eerie to stand here and think about that afternoon and what happened right here in this parking lot. From this point forward, we don't know for sure what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. His Pontiac Granville was found in the restaurant parking lot, and he was seen by witnesses climbing into a maroon Mercury marquee. The three men Hoffa was expecting, Tony Giacalone, Tony Provenzano and mob associate Lenny Schultz never showed. So who did Hoffa get in the car with? Where was he killed? How was he killed? What happened to the body? We're about a five minute drive north of the Marcus Red Fox restaurant. We're in front of a home on Long Lake Road. We're also in Bloomfield Township. In 1975, this house was owned by a guy named Carlo Lacata. He was a soldier in the Detroit Mafia. Investigator journalist Scott Bernstein believes this is the place where Jimmy Hoffa was killed. I believe that on the afternoon of July 30, 1975, Billy Giacalone, Tony's brother, uh, Anthony Tony Pal Palazzolo, who was uh, an up-and-coming Detroit mobster that represented the uh, Vitali crew down in Greektown, as well as uh, Salvatore Sally Bugs Bergulio, who was representing Tony Provenzano's Genovese crew, uh, picked Hoffa up at the parking lot of the Red Fox in Joey Giacalone's Mercury Marquis and enticed him into the car, lured him to this meeting under the pretense that uh, the meeting that they were supposed to have at the Red Fox had been moved down the street to the Lakata house. Again, this is a, a house that Hoffa had met Giacalone at before. He was familiar with the residents. He had been to sit downs here, so it wouldn't have been odd to him to be told that. And I believe he was taken here and probably killed pretty quickly upon um, setting foot uh, on the property, um, possibly in the garage or right while he was walking into the house from the garage. But recently, Bernstein heard from a former mob associate of Lenny Schultz with a new story. He says Schultz told the mob associate back in the 90s that Hoffa was killed at Schultz's home in Franklin, Michigan, also a short drive from the Marcus Red Fox restaurant. According to Bernstein, this unnamed mob associate said, quote, 
They choked him out in the living room and gave the body to Roland McMaster to get rid of. End quote. Bernstein says he has reason to question the reliability of this account and is still backing his Lakata house theory as the scene of the murder. Another popular theory about where Hoffa was killed was offered by Frank Sheeran in the book I Heard You Paint Houses. The new Scorsese film, The Irishman, is based on that book. In Frank Sheeran's telling of that day, Hoffa was driven to a house in northwest Detroit where Sheeran shot and killed him. Around the intersection of Seven and Evergreen, which really doesn't make any sense to me. First, you can't source the house. You can't tell me whose house that was. Wherever they took him was going to be a very controlled, secured environment where the mobsters that were perpetrating the, the murder would be able to control every factor, every, um, every variable would have been secured and completely controlled. The idea that they would take Jimmy Hoffa on a 20-minute drive from the Red Fox to that, uh, that house just doesn't make sense to me. Hoffa would not feel comfortable, A, going to a house he'd never been to before, and B, driving a, a, a long distance. Veteran journalist Dan Moldea doesn't believe Sheeran either. Frank, I'm sure Frank Sheeran did, did some pretty nasty work. I just don't think he's committed the murders, he's, these big murders he's confessed to. I do not think he killed Jimmy Hoffa. The day after Hoffa disappeared, his family began to believe the worst. This is James Hoffa Jr. When my mother called me on that morning and she told me that he had not come home all night and not called, I knew that I could only draw the worst conclusions because that was not my father. It wasn't like Hoffa not to come home at night, or at least call. There had been no word from him since the previous afternoon. We would also like to make a special appeal to the some two million brother and sister Teamster members for them to aid us in solving this heartbreaking mystery. Our mother has courageously survived many ordeals in her 38 years of marriage. We have faith that someone, somehow, somewhere, can help us locate our father. Shortly after his disappearance, Hoffa's family gave the FBI a calendar which hung on Jimmy Hoffa's refrigerator. In the square for Wednesday, July 30th, it read, TJ, 2 p.m. Presumably, a meeting with Tony Giacalone, who was also known as Tony Jack. Giacalone, later questioned by the FBI, said there was no planned meeting and that he was with Lenny Schultz at the Southfield Athletic Club that afternoon. We're in front of Traveler's Tower. This is on Evergreen at 10 Mile. Now, back in the 70s, the lower levels of this building were the Southfield Athletic Club. Now, the club is long gone. It's closed up about 20 years or so. But it was a hopping place in the summer of 1975. The unofficial headquarters for Detroit mob boss Tony Giacalone. Uh, he spent the entire day in the Southfield Athletic Club. Former assistant U.S. attorney Keith Corbett. And he was not a particularly approachable person in normal events, but it seems like every 15 minutes he was asking somebody in the Southfield Athletic Club, what time is it now? So that you could basically bring in a parade of witnesses. And say, oh, Tony Giacalone asked, asked me what time it was at 12.15 p.m., 12.30 p.m. Somebody else, he asked me what time it was at 1 o'clock in order to establish that he was present in the Southfield Athletic Club during the entire period of time when uh, Mr. Hoffa disappeared. So those are the kinds of things that sort of alarm bells in anybody, any investigator's head. But nevertheless, it was an excellent alibi for uh, Anthony Giacalone as to where he was. In the days that followed Hoffa's disappearance, the FBI questioned Tony Provenzano. He had people who swore he was in Union City, New Jersey on July 30th, all day playing cards. The FBI was never able to verify that story. They began to focus on two men as Hoffa's suspected assassins, Thomas Andrada and Salvatore Bregulio, both soldiers in the Genovese crime family who worked for Tony Provenzano. Bregulio told the FBI that he was among those playing cards with Tony Pro in New Jersey that day. Dan Moldea was a young reporter investigating the Teamsters pension fund around the time Hoffa disappeared. After learning Bregulio was suspected of the murder, he says he called him up at Bregulio's New Jersey Teamster Hall. Sal Bregulio comes on the phone, and I said, 
uh, Mr. Bergoglio? He said, who's this? I said, my name's Sam Aldea. I'm a reporter. And, uh, and I, uh, what do you want to talk to me about? I said, the Hoffa case. I want to talk about the, he goes, what makes you think I've got anything to say about that? I said, because Mr. Bergoglio, you've neither been arrested nor indicted. And yet everybody is blaming you for this murder. Moldea talked his way into a meeting with Bergoglio at Local 560 in Union City, New Jersey. And I was in the waiting room, and Bergoglio comes into the room, little guy, tough, wiry, and Bill Buffalino's with him. And I knew Bill Buffalino from the grand jury the previous year. So I say, hey, Danny, how you doing? Nice to see you. You know, this is Sal Bergoglio. How are you, sir? Nice to meet you. Buffalino and Bergoglio then invited Moldea to lunch. And so the three of them get into Bergoglio's car and drive to a nearby restaurant. And sitting at a table is Sal's brother Gabe and their associate Steve Andrada. And I go, I'm going to get the interview with Hoffa's killers here. And so um, we eat, you know, they're, they, they're, they're checking me out and stuff. They won't, they won't let me turn the tape recorder on at that point. And then when finally they were convinced that I was okay, we went back to the union hall. So it's me, Sal Bergulio, Steve Andretta, Bill Buffalino, and also we were joined by Sammy Provenzano, who's Tony Provenzano's brother. And so, and then Stevie during the interview introduces me to Tommy Andretta. Uh, so I interviewed these guys three and a half hours on tape, on tape. And, um, and what became clear was, what happened was, Steve Andretta, who I don't believe was involved in the actual murder, I think he was Tony Provenzano's alibi in New Jersey. I think Tommy Andretta was right there. I think Tommy Andretta was a participant in this. Certainly Sal, I think Sal's the killer. Recently, Anthony Provenzano, Thomas Andretta, and the Bergoglio brothers were indicted by grand juries in New York and New Jersey on matters not directly related to the Hoffa case. This is part of the government strategy to try to crack the mystery through continuous pressure. Bregulio was brought twice before a federal grand jury in Detroit investigating Hoffa's disappearance. He refused to testify, and the FBI never had enough evidence to charge him. He was murdered on the streets of Little Italy in New York in 1978. Less than two weeks after Hoffa's disappearance, the FBI reported they had found blood in the back seat of what they believed to be the car that drove Hoffa to his execution. A maroon Mercury Marquis belonging to Tony Giacalone's son, Joey. The FBI also knew that on July 30th, that car had been driven by Hoffa's surrogate son, Chucky O'Brien. Chucky was, from the very beginning, portrayed by the FBI in its public discussions of the case as the person who picked up Hoffa and drove him to his death. And if you think about it, this is a completely despicable thing if Chucky did it. Hoffa was the closest thing Chucky ever had to a father. Chucky revered Hoffa. Hoffa loved Chucky. He referred to him as his second son. This is Chucky O'Brien's stepson, Jack Goldsmith. He's a law professor at Harvard and spent the last several years working on a book about Hoffa and O'Brien. Chucky was a man who was basically his adult life was defined by his closeness to Jimmy Hoffa. He met Hoffa when he was nine years old. He was by Hoffa's side from the early 50s until late 1974 through all of his travails. He took Josephine Hoffa to see uh, Jimmy Hoffa in prison. So he was, he was very, very close to Hoffa. He was also close to um, Anthony Giacalone, whom he also met as a young man. And uh, he knew lots of the senior Detroit crime figures. Chucky O'Brien is the son of Sylvia Pagano, the Mafia paramour we talked about back in episode one. Pagano was the original contact between Hoffa and the Detroit Mafia back in the 40s. And eventually, O'Brien became the bridge between Hoffa and mobsters Tony Giacalone and Tony Provenzano. But in late 1974, O'Brien and Hoffa had a falling out. When Chucky learned for the first time Hoffa had always said that he supported Chucky's efforts to have a position in Local 299, but he really never supported Chucky's efforts to have serious labor responsibilities in the union. 
Chucky finally confronted him about that in, at, in, at Thanksgiving, and that basically led to them parting ways. Here's O'Brien speaking to WDIV back in 1993. He describes why he was driving the Maroon Marquis on the day Hoffa disappeared. July 30th is, was the worst day in my life. Chucky says he was in the process because of moving to Florida and didn't have a car that day, day so he borrowed one from his friend Joey Giacalone, the son of Chucky's side. uncle Tony. He delivered a large frozen salmon, a gift Nobody from a Seattle teamster, to, to Bobby Holmes and his that. wife in suburban was, Farmington Hills. The fish was melting water and blood on the seat of the car. So now I'm carrying it in the house, and, and, and she's a particular housekeeper, and she's yelling at me, you're ruining my floor, you're getting that water and blood all over. Later, Chucky says he had the car cleaned at a car wash not far from the Red Fox, then returned the car and got a ride back to the home where he was staying just a few minutes from the Red Fox. Bobby Holmes and his wife Violet, the recipients of the fish, corroborated O'Brien's story. I don't think Chucky O'Brien would have would, would ever have hurt Jimmy Hoffa under any circumstances. I think he would have died for him. Jack Goldsmith can't say for sure that his stepdad is innocent of involvement in Hoffa's murder, but says he has poured over grand jury testimony and FBI witness statements and pieced together the timeline of the afternoon of July 30th. Goldsmith believes O'Brien would not have had time to deliver the fish, get the car washed, pick up Hoffa, drive him to his death, return the car to Joey Giacalone, and get back to Teamsters Local 299 by 4.30 when witnesses say they saw him there. For 44 years, the conventional wisdom really unquestioned in the public mind and repeated in book after book and in movie after movie and in article after article is that Chucky did this despicable thing. Now, of course, Chucky has for 44 years been trying to deny it. He alone among the suspects talked to the FBI twice. He's tried to clear his name through going on television and denying it. He's tried everything he could, and he wasn't able to. And as I think I show in the book, uh, he, he wasn't involved in the Hoffa disappearance. And more importantly, the FBI doesn't believe that he was. They have reasons to think, good reasons to think he didn't do it and that someone else was involved. But this great misconception persists, unfortunately, for him. No charges have been brought against anyone in Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance. But one question has continued to prompt FBI searches and conspiracy theories for over 40 years. Where is the body? In May of 2004, police pulled up floorboards in a Northwest Detroit home. Uh, we did not uncover any evidence relevant to the investigation on James Hoffa. In 2012, police dug up a backyard in Roseville. I would say it has no credibility at all. In 2013, acting on a tip from mob boss Tony Zarilli, the FBI dug on a farm on Buell Road in Oakland Township. All day long, the hoopla grew and grew. Once word spread, the dig for Hoffa's remains had begun. The satellite Again, coming up empty. Why have there been so many seemingly credible tips? Scott Bernstein says it's because the Giacalone brothers launched a campaign of misinformation to cover up the perfect crime. So I believe the Giacalone brothers were incredibly proud and they really wore the fact that they pulled this crime of the century off so successfully. They really wore it as a badge of honor and they really got their kicks out of tweaking people about it and they you know, my research tells me that they launched a disinformation campaign from 1975 and into the 2000s when they both passed away, where they would, you know, intentionally tell 30 people 30 different things. And both Billy and Tony knew that they were kibitzing, they were tweaking, they were, they were gaslighting. Let's focus on three possibilities. Number one. Scott Bernstein and Keith Corbett, former assistant U.S. attorney, have come to the same conclusion. Okay, we're in Hamtramck. Hamtramck is widely known for Polish bakeries, but that's not why we're here today. There's not much to see here now, but this used to be 8215 Moran. In 1975, it was a mob-owned trash company 
It was called Central Sanitation. It was owned by two Detroit mob lieutenants, Peter Vitale and Jimmy Quasrano. And they had these gigantic compressors for cardboard where they compressed three, four, five tons of cardboard at one time and shred it down to little pieces of paper. And people were not thinking in 1975 of DNA. So you throw a body in there, it just gets crushed up. And then surprisingly, a couple of months after Hoffa disappeared, the, the place burned down. So, what a coincidence. What a coincidence. And, you know, the people, the insurance policy paid off, you know, and uh, everybody was happy. Everybody now, Dan Moldea has done his own research and says there's no way the body was disposed of at Central Sanitation. The Central Sanitation theory was dismissed by the FBI in... 1978, in a, in a very open statement where the FBI said, this is not what we believe, we check this out, and we have completely rejected the central sanitation theory. Possibility number two. A new character enters the story. A small-time criminal named Donovan Wells, who died this past year. In 2006, an FBI search focused on a farm in Milford, Michigan, once owned by union leader and Hoffa enemy, Roland McMaster. Donovan Wells and his wife lived on that farm back in 1975. On the day of the murder, Don Wells' wife, Monica, she's at the farmhouse, she's in the kitchen, and she's washing dishes, looking out towards Pontiac Trail. And she sees two cars come screaming down Pontiac Trail, make a hard right into this dirt road into this dirt road, which goes all the way into the back of the farm. And Don Wells told the FBI, at the back of the farm where these guys, there was a pre-dug hole. Okay, it was a pre-dug hole. So Monica Wells sees McMaster and she tells him this story about, geez, there was a strange thing. These cars came roaring up. And, and McMaster, what he said, he basically threatened her. You know, blondes who talk too much don't get old. You know, so he made some crack about it. At one time, Donovan Wells was represented by a lawyer named Jim Ellsman. He says Wells told him a similar story, that on July 30th, 1975, in that farmhouse kitchen with his wife, Donovan Wells was convinced he saw Jimmy Hoffa's body getting buried. He observes out the kitchen window of McMaster's farmhouse a backhoe digging and then a white sheet and a body dropped into the hole. I believe that Hoffa was murdered on that farm. I think the cars roaring up, I think that was, those, that's where the death was. I think those were the, the, the death, Hoffa was in one of those cars and he was murdered. The FBI dug up that farm and found nothing. But Dan Moldea throws an interesting wrinkle into that episode. He says Donovan Wells showed him a diagram of the farm with the exact location of that hole where he claimed to have seen someone dump a body, a diagram the FBI used to pick their spot for the 2006 excavation. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at Don's diagram. They got south and north mixed up. The barn was over here. They dug, they, they inverted the, they inverted the, uh, map, the diagram that Don had drawn for them, didn't bring him up from Lexicon, and they dug in the wrong place. Does that mean Hoffa's body might be buried on that farm in Milford? Moldea says he now believes the body was there originally, but that it was then taken to a landfill in New Jersey, operated by a guy named Phil Moscato. Moscato was a soldier in the East Coast Genovese crime family, and he told Dan Modea about a day in 1975 when his friend, hitman Sal Bregulio, pulled up in a truck. And I'm sitting with Phil on his front porch. I got the tape recorder on. And so he tells me on tape that the gateway truck pulls up at his dump and he and Sal unload the 55 gallon drum and bury it at his dump. He tells me that on tape. I was ready to, when he says this to me, I was ready to shut the tape, I was ready to take the tape recorder like a football and put it under my arm and run to my car and get the fuck out of there before this guy realized what he had said to me. 
And so I got to know Phil. I got to know Phil Moscato. Now, he gave me information with the frequency of a kosher butcher handing out pork sausages, but he <laughs> gave me some key stuff. He told me Vito Giacalone basically was driving the car. He told me Tony Provenzano, yeah, was in Detroit that day. And he was close to Tony Provenzano. Now there's a new twist. Follow along with me. Dan says he has been working with Frank Coppola. He's the son of Paul Coppola, who was a business partner of Phil Moscato. He's also working with Phil Moscato's son, Phil Jr. Both Frank and Phil Jr. say their fathers, before they died, told the sons the exact location where Jimmy Hoffa is buried. It's not clear why they've waited years to announce this, but they've convinced Dan Moldea that they're for real. His remains will be in at the bottom of that drum. And I've told all my sources, whether it's Phil Jr. or Frank, I've said no one gets any money until this is proven to be that there's a body there and that the testing the, the, by, a, by federal law enforcement authorities says that this is the one and only Jimmy Hoffa. At that point, you guys deserve the moon and the stars. You guys deserve all the money you can get, all the reward money. And everything. I don't want any of it. I just want to be the guy who has that story. That's all I want. I want to be there at the denouement of this case. And I want to be able to take a bow when this is done. I am unabashed about this. I deserve this moment. There is no justice in this world if I don't get this moment. The FBI and a lot of other people remain skeptical. As of now, there are no digs planned at that site. And yes, there are other theories. Okay, we're on Jefferson Avenue in downtown Detroit. We're in front of the Renaissance Center. Now, the Renaissance definitely looks a lot different than it did back in the summer of 1975. The towers of this enormous complex now include a hotel and General Motors World Headquarters. But in 1975, it was brand new. It was under construction, and that's very important. There are people who will insist that Jimmy Hoffa was buried that summer underneath the Rensen. The guy who sells the story the hardest that Jimmy Hoffa's buried here is Marvin the Weasel Elkin. Marvin was Jimmy Hoffa's driver for five years. Marvin says in the summer of 1976, there was a convention downtown of Teamsters. He was in the entourage of Tony Giacalone. He was there at this convention to light cigars and get drinks for all the big bosses. He says they're walking down here along Jefferson Avenue and Tony Giacalone stops and turns to the entourage and says, Boys, say good morning to Mr. Hoffa. So there's no question in my mind, never has been. That's exactly, exactly where he is. Will we ever know the answers? Or does the FBI already know the answers but won't share? We reached out to them, but we're told the Bureau doesn't comment on open cases. Is there anybody still around who could have pertinent information? Not very many people. Both the Jackalonis are gone, uh, Toko's gone, uh, the people in New Jersey are gone now. There may be some peripheral figures, but all the main players uh, have, uh, have passed on since. Uh, uh, so since it's time for the FBI to release all the files. Well, uh, one of the problems with that, and I understand the, the public's desire to know what's going on. The Detroit the Free files. Press fought a 10-year legal battle over FBI files sought through the Freedom of Information Act. The Free Press sued the government twice, and finally the FBI was forced to release thousands of pages of Hoffa documents. But many were so heavily redacted as to render them useless. Should the FBI release the remaining Hoffa files? The answer is yes or no, depending upon who you talk to. If you can't indict somebody and convict them, you really shouldn't throw names out in the press. And uh, despite what we may see in politics today, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the government should only speak when it has an indictment to bring against somebody and then let the jury resolve it. And we've never been in a position to indict anybody in connection with the Hoffa disappearance. So if the sealed files protect some group or individuals, I asked Dan Moldea, who are we protecting here? And the answer is, I don't know. Which brings us to the final page of the Hoffa story. 
This is the place in a novel where a good writer ties up loose ends, answers unresolved questions that have nagged at the reader for 300 pages. But this isn't a crime novel, and the real world rarely fits into a nice, neat package. For over a hundred years, mafia crime has been shrouded in mystery and conspiracy. We get threads of information that lead us down intriguing tunnels to even more unanswered questions. The Hoffa case is no different. Which is why 45 years later, and maybe for the next 45 years, investigators will keep digging. Thanks for joining us through this season of Shattered. If you want to support our show, please tell your friends. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you want even more Shattered, you should consider joining Shattered Plus. For just $25 a year, you get a bonus episode with each regular episode, and also access to the show without ads. Your support helps us keep making more seasons of Shattered. On Episode 5 Plus, we interview a legendary Teamster dissident. Ken Path has been working to reform the Teamsters since 1976. He's the national organizer of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. The power of organized crime in this country is down. When you're in New York City, you don't have Italian mobsters running the show. You got Wall Street, you got the banking industry, you got the oil corporations, they're running the show. To hear that interview and a lot of other great material, Sign up for Shattered Plus today. Go to shatteredpodcast.com for more information. I'm Steve Garagiola. Shattered is produced and edited by Zach Rosen and Jeremy Allen. We want to thank all of the experts, journalists, and scholars who helped us tell the Hoffa story. Dan Moldea, Scott Bernstein, Keith Corbett, Jack Goldsmith, Robert Blakey, Jim Neff, Merrick Masters, Elizabeth Fowle, Nelson Lichtenstein, David Whitler, and Marvin the Weasel Elkin. Marvin, mostly because I just like saying Marvin the Weasel. Oh, and by the way, if you should solve the Hoffa case, can you let us know? I'd sure love to know how this story ends. <laughs>